Good morning, everybody. It's Father Ryan, the rector of St. Thomas Episcopal Church in St. Petersburg, Florida. And it is my pleasure and privilege to be joined today by Dr. Valerie Cooper, who is a teacher at Duke Divinity School, where she's the Associate Professor of Religion and Society and Black Church Studies. But I know Dr. Cooper from when she was a professor at Wake Forest University, where she was my absolute favorite teacher in the religion <laughs> department. And so, Dr. Cooper, thank you so much for being with us today for this conversation. Uh, I'd like to begin with a prayer, and then we'll get a little bit into some introduction. This prayer comes from a text called Race and Prayer, which is edited by Malcolm Boyd and Chester Talton. God of infinite compassion, we live in times of turmoil. Out of our fear, we seek to target and to blame the innocent. Out of our ignorance, we tolerate racist systems that oppress and demean our brothers and sisters. God of justice, help us to resist all forms of racial profiling, confront our prejudices, expand our understanding, Strengthen our resistance. Help us to resist the urge to protect ourselves at the expense of others. Remind us that all people are ultimately yours. This we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, as everyone hopefully just heard in my sermon for the Feast of Pentecost, I talk about the civil unrest that's going on in our country today, uh, most recently because of the killing of George Floyd. And I began to think, what can I do in my position? What, can, what else can I do? What more can I do uh, to bring attention, to bring understanding to this? And that took me in my thoughts all the way back to my time at Wake Forest. And I remembered that Dr. Cooper was one of the people who was extremely instrumental in launching me on a anti-racism, and uh, racial understanding path of learning that I really feel like I'm still on today. So first, Dr. Cooper, thank you for, for that, for your gentle introduction to this material uh, for me. I think that, you know, as we, as we begin to talk about some of this stuff, it's important, uh, as you've said, Dr. Cooper, to acknowledge that these are difficult conversations. I know in my body right now, I'm even feeling a little bit of, uh, of some nervousness about talking about these things. And so I wonder if you, might, if you might address that, because I know that this probably can't be easy for you either. Well, so first of all, thank you for thinking of me and for reaching out to me. And, uh, you know, I, I was thinking about how wonderful it is to have had a student like you, um, you know, thoughtful, engaged, asking great questions. Uh, I'm also really excited for this opportunity to, to to participate in your life as a pastor and um, in your congregation's life. And so thank you for that invitation as well. Yeah, you know, these are difficult conversations and we should acknowledge that they're difficult for pastors to make. Um, so at Duke Divinity School, I train pastors. And one of the things that we talk about is the real difficulty having hard conversations with the congregation. Because of the feedback, because of the challenge, um, because uh, people will, you know, might choose to withhold their giving, for example. This is like politi politically dangerous. And yet I feel like it's really, 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 really important. Where else are we going to learn how to have hard conversations, difficult conversations, and challenging conversations? If you think about what Jesus was doing, with his disciples. If you think about what discipleship meant in the life of Jesus, it was teaching his disciples to do the hard work of being a community, of caring about one another, about listening to one another. And Jesus never um, pulls his punches. You know, no, he certainly doesn't. You know, if, if you're going to follow me, you need to take up your cross. 
I mean, he didn't, you know, that wasn't part of a three-step sermon series. He starts with <laughs> taking up your cross. <laughs> like, he's not going to ease them into the cross thing. The cross is front and center, right? That's, um, right. That's right. And so, so our, our life as disciples of Christ has to also include this ability to have the difficult conversations. Um, if you go back in, in my history, you'll find that I once had a, I, I did, did an interview on an NPR station in Virginia about having difficult conversations at Thanksgiving, right? Oh, <laughs> you, know, <geez. laughs> you know, like, let's go there. I mean, not to force them, but not to fear them either, not to run from them. This might be an opportunity to get to know one another and to talk about things that we don't ordinarily talk about. Well, there's also the communion table that we gather around. Um, might not our love for one another enable us to have conversations that are difficult? Particularly with regard to race, what I've noticed is that um, African Americans want a safe space to talk about the issues that concern us. And often in integrated spaces, we don't feel that safety. I once had a conversation with a pastor um, here in, the, uh, in my region near Durham, who um, was a white man pastoring a predominantly black congregation. And um, he said that his congregants wanted to know if they could tell him their difficult details. And the way he put it was, um, they wanted to punch me around a little bit, and then I was their pastor. Mm -hmm. That is, they wanted to be able to have the conversations that feel like a gut punch, and to know that he would stay in the conversation long enough to hear it all. Mm -hmm. And then, if he could endure the gut punch conversations, they knew he was their pastor. And, and that's actually, I think, very, very true. So learning these skills, um, having these difficult conversations is, is, I think, a spiritual discipline. I also want to invite your listeners to hear charitably, to not be listening for um, the stumbles or the struggles, or to be listening intentionally for things you disagree with. But to listen in love, to listen charitably, to listen as we struggle with difficult issues, um, and hopefully to have some grace for us as we do it, because it's not easy. Thank you. I, I think that's such an important reminder, and it's a good reminder for me as well. Well, you mentioned gut punch, and uh, the country is just reeling right now, as we've have seen night after night of protests and riots. Uh, in, in response to the killing of George Floyd in, in Minneapolis. Um, you're a lifelong Methodist, if I remember right. Is, is that correct? That's absolutely true. So, so as you know, you've spent time, I think, in, in churches that are predominantly white churches, predominantly black churches, and some diverse churches. And you've done some missions in, in various places around the world. Uh, and so in times like these, and, and perhaps especially in times that aren't as charged as these, what can we do as predominantly white churches to increase knowledge and awareness, to promote justice? I think in a word, how can we be allies? This is a great question. So first of all, let's acknowledge the difficulty of it. Let's acknowledge that this is emotional, physical and intellectual work. Um, you may not know much about racial justice issues. Um, you probably were not well taught or introduced to these issues until, you know, you maybe didn't hear about it in high school. Um, you maybe didn't hear about it in college. Um, I know that for my students in grad school taking my classes, um, this material feels really hard because they hadn't heard it before. Mm -hmm. When we look at American history and look at essentially our failures with regard to race, it's a hard history to hear. And it's hard to hear all at once. Um, so let's acknowledge that it's gonna be work. One stumbling block that I feel a lot of people have and struggle with is the reality that, the fear that they'll say something wrong um, that they don't know the right terminology, that they'll offend. 
So I'm always encouraging my students, if you don't know what the proper terminology is, and sometimes it changes, um, it's fair to ask. I don't mm -hmm. know what to call you. Do you prefer black or African American? And then mm -hmm. I'll say either one. I don't. I use. I mix them up. You know. And then, and then I'm. You know, if I'm in a classroom setting, I might. You know, talk about the the minor differences between the terms. Um, you talk to someone else, and they might say something else. Um, or um, yeah, because that can be pretty personal too. That's right. Well, yeah. but but it's it's acknowledging that this is a minefield, and that's always fair. That's always appropriate, and people. I, I've never met anyone who didn't want to be asked what they prefer. Hmm. Chocolate or vanilla or strawberry, which would you like, you know, as opposed to just ordering it, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. so, so the first thing to say is, um, uh, how, what are the terms? And then in my classroom, I, I have students usually on the first day, I tell them we're going to be talking about difficult stuff. This is going to be emotional work. Um, you may hear something that offends you. If you do, let me ask you, rather than go home and tell your roommate or your partner, let me ask you, give us a first opportunity to fix it. If someone says something that offends you or hurts you, let me, let me, tell, let me ask you to promise me you will stop us to address that hurt. You won't go home and let it fester. You will let us fix it there. You will trust us enough to hear you and to do what we can to make it right. That creates that safe environment where this yeah. kind of exploration can be done. That's the goal. The goal is to create a safe space where you can talk about this. Now, when I tell my colleagues this, they, uh, they, they then ask, well, how many times have you been stopped? Hmm. I have not yet been stopped. Now I've been doing this since uh, 2001 or so, right? I have not yet been stopped. What typically happens is that students will come to me after class and they'll say, Dr. Cooper, I hope I didn't offend you when I said. Mm -hmm. and, and then the test is, how am I going to react to what might have been personally offensive? And I have yet to have heard anything that a student said in class that I found personally offensive, right? But what they're figuring out is that, is this, is this classroom really a safe space? Right. Um, is this teacher really going to be fair? But they're also figuring out the limits of these conversations. And what I hope they're learning is that there's, they're, they're tremendously flexible because there's grace. So that's what I'm hoping that we're creating in this moment, is a moment of tremendous um, opportunity for us to have a conversation that's difficult, but that's pressing and that's needed. And that we might carry from it some skills um, in other conversations and maybe even some courage to initiate conversations. So what can you do to be an ally? First of all, educate yourself. Conversations mm -hmm. like this, there are tons of uh, um, materials on, online, there are books, there are libraries, there are people doing workshops and the like. Um, inviting conversations with co-workers, with uh, neighbors, with friends, um, observing what's going on, being informed. I, I love, you know, sometimes you meet Christians who, who don't like to read the news or read the newspaper or watch the news or what have you. I've never been that kind of a Christian. Um, I think being, being aware of what's going on in your world is, is, is a Christian virtue. Mm. Um, so education, engagement, um, asking questions, asking, you know, your congregational leaders, what can, what, can we do, can we do a book study? Can we bring in speakers? There often are lots and lots of resources that are available. Um, and, and I don't want to downplay the very important um, detail of prayer. Mm, absolutely. Um, asking God, you know, what do you have for me? What, what do you want of me? I, my experience of prayer is this, I bring things up with God, and then it's like I hear them on NPR or something. I mean, I gotta hear them everywhere. <laughs> that is, it's an ongoing conversation, maybe not immediately, but the things I bring up in prayer, then God brings back to me in, right. in conversations with others. And I, I, I'm noticing them in the same way that Moses noticed, noticed that the bush was burning and wasn't consumed. Open um, your ears, O oh faithful people. That's right. As, prayer is an invitation for God to change the circumstances around you and to change your attentiveness to them. 
So I want to, I think that all of those are ways that people can be allies. That's, that's fantastic. That's a great start for us. Thank you. So as a seminary professor who is training pastors, how are you thinking about incidents like this in, in terms of the gospel? <laughs> Excuse me. Well, um, I have to say that uh, it, it's sort of the summertime, which is actually kind of the busy season for us. And so part of the ways that I'm thinking about this is I'm thinking in terms of um, pieces that I'm writing, and pieces that I've been invited to write. I was invited recently to write about hope, um, hope in dark times. It's a, a journal issue, and, um, and I've been thinking about two ideas about hope. One is hope deferred makes the heart grow sick. And the other is about Abraham from Romans 4, 18 to 22. Abraham hoped against hope, right? So on the one hand, there's hoping against hope. And the other, hope deferred. I know that for me, um, these are particularly difficult times because I was tremendously hopeful about America's ability to overcome its history of racial inequality after the election of Barack Obama. I went to the uh, inauguration, I you know, um, worked on the campaign, um, I believe that if America elected an African-American man, it would say something about our ability to, to transcend our difference. And, you know, I didn't agree with everything that Barack Obama did, but um, it was a scandal-free eight-year administration. Um, he loves his wife. I mean, he loves him some Michelle. He mm. loves her, right? <laughs> Um, they have two amazing and accomplished and beautiful daughters. Uh, and um, when, when Donald Trump was elected, I for one was terrified mm. by that. Um, terrified because I believe that Donald Trump was pretty clear about the racism inherent in his appeal and his, his calls for violence. Um, uh, I've worked in Charlottesville and I have family from Charlottesville and the um, Unite the Right rally slash riot in Charlottesville and the president's um, statements that um, there were good people on both sides. Uh, my colleagues and friends in Charlottesville were horrified and you know I remember hearing from people as the police broke up the worship service that was happening in the Episcopal Church across the street from the mm -hmm. University of Virginia because they were afraid the rioters were coming there. And so they were escorting clergy out of the building by the back door, right? Um, because I was so hopeful of seeing a dawn of racial justice in my lifetime, I am particularly despairing mm. um, because I had accepted um, a narrative of racial justice that was, you know, constantly moving upwards. This particular dip is most heartbreaking to me. Um, and so holding on to hope, hoping against hope is a real challenge for me, real, you know, the other difficulty is um, in the midst of the COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic that we're experiencing, communities of color have been disproportionately hit. And so... You just wrote an article on that, in fact. I did. I did. And I'm happy to share that with your congregation. We've already shared it with everyone. For those who <laughs> care to read it, it's on our Facebook page now. Thank you. Um, so the, the point for me is that um, I've, in April, I lost two members of my extended family. Hmm. Uh, one member of my extended family, the funeral wasn't until two or three days ago wow. because she died in New York and this, th there was no one to write death certificates. They were so overwhelmed by death. Um, that was April. And then in May, three members of my family were hospitalized with COVID. So communities of color have been disproportionately hit and, and people of color have been disproportionately hit. 
And so when I look at um, Abraham's response, hoping against hope, he's hoping in the midst of death for resurrection. Um, there's no reason to believe in resurrection except faith, except hope. And yet we're called to be a people who believe in resurrection, life in the midst of death. And so that's a kind of, that's a very muscular hope. That's a very strong, mm. that's a very powerful hope. And so I've been thinking about the things that have inspired hope in me. Um, I, I wrote about hope. Um, I found a picture. Uh, my mom found it. A picture of me. I'm about four years old. <laughs> I'm, um, I'm wearing a University of Virginia sweatshirt um, over my Easter dress. I have my Easter dress and my Easter hat. And, um, and my brother's beside me and he's um, playing with a truck. I think we must have visited my grandmother in Charlottesville. And my parents must have said, what would you like? And I asked for a sweatshirt, a University of Virginia sweatshirt. So there I am, a little black girl, wearing a University of Virginia sweatshirt in Charlottesville. What I realized when my mother discovered that picture after I was teaching at the University of Virginia was that when the picture was taken, the University of Virginia had not admitted either blacks nor women. Mm -hmm. I'm a little black girl wearing a University of Virginia sweatshirt before University of Virginia has admitted any little black girls. Talk about prophecy. You know, it, it, but, but, and, and God, but God, right? right. But I wondered what my grandmother thought when she saw me in that sweatshirt. Mm. And I wondered what my father thought when he saw me in that sweatshirt. That's hope. So I'm holding on to hope in the midst of darkness um, because I believe it is my call as a Christian. Um, I'm encouraged by that because I'll be honest, I felt a little bit like Ezekiel standing in front of the Valley of Dry Bones and can only come up with the best answer of, oh, Lord, you know. <laughs> That's right. That's right. You no, know, I don't. That's right. It doesn't make any sense. They shouldn't be able, those bones should not come together. Can these bones live was the question God put. And Ezekiel said, ah, I, don't know. Know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Lord, Doesn't you look good right now. That's right. They're looking real dead. Yeah. It's looking very bad. And, and, and there's nothing about Christianity that calls us to deny the reality. These things are held in tension, right? On the one hand, the bones are dead, Lord, and they've been dead a while, and you know this better than I. Mm -hmm. But what you know that I don't know, Lord, is what you can do with those bones. Teach me. Lord, you know, right? And so we're holding that in balance. I'm watching the riots at night and my heart is broken. I finally had to turn off the television set. Yeah. And yet I wake up this morning and God's mercies are new every morning. And I've got to stay in hope. And so this is an expression of that. I don't give up. I don't give in. I acknowledge I'm tired and I'm sad. And Lord, these past two months have been hellacious. So yeah. difficult. So troubling. Every day worse. And yet, you can make those bones live if you choose. Tell us what you, you, mean, you, you mentioned watching the TV and, and looking at the, the protests and the riots. I, I've, I've not... I've not watched any of it because uh, I, I've not really wanted to, to be honest. Um, I watched them incessantly after Ferguson, but I, I, I haven't really wanted to pay attention to these. Um, let's talk for, for a few minutes about the reason those protests and those riots have gotten started. Where, you know, uh, George Floyd was killed by, by a white police officer, and this is not an isolated incident. Uh, but just one more incident in a long line of incidents, and and you can you can name these these people that uh, that that have been at the center of these. Um, Christian Cooper in the park, Ahmed Arbery in Georgia, uh, Brianna Taylor in her own home, right? yes. and and George Floyd um, uh, outside in the street. Um, as an American, if you've if you've not seen the video. 
And I'll be honest, I haven't seen it. Uh, I have not wanted to watch it. I have watched some of the other ones and I, I feel like I don't need in my soul to watch this one. Um, but if you've not seen the video, you're at least aware of it. You're at least aware of the circumstances and, and aware of, of what's going on. And, and uh, you know, the shocking image of, of four police officers uh, kneeling on this man's body um, one of those officers has now been charged with third degree murder. I believe all four have been terminated from their positions. And when we see stuff like that, you know, some people, they want to lump in all law enforcement officers with, with people like this. Um, but I know, because I'm friends with some of them, that there are good law enforcement officers out there. So one of the things I'm wondering about from your, from your position and from your perspective how can some of these good law enforcement officers affect change from within the system that they are in? What can, what can they do? You know, I, I have to say that I've been very encouraged by your conversation with your, um, your by, by your description of your relationship with the air marshal that you knew at your previous year. Yeah, yeah. Um, What's up, you, Chad, if you're listening? <laughs> <laughs> You two stayed in the difficult conversation. And it sounds to me like an example of deep discipleship that went both ways. And friendship, like authentic friendship. Absolutely. You would go with him to the firing range and he would go with you to difficult places for him. Um, and you pressed one another. And you learned from one another. I mean, I think that's fabulous. I think that's brilliant. I, I, first of all, I don't think that, that you should take um, even these protests as being protests against all police officers. I mean, many of us, if not most of us, know police officers who don't qualify as authoritarian or using excessive force. I know that I have a student um, who graduated a year or two ago who's uh, going to the police academy, so he's taking his uh, theological education with him. Um, you know, I know people who are chaplains for the police. Um, this isn't about all police officers, but this is about um, community health. And um, it seems to me that if, if you are regarded as dangerous because of your skin color, we've got a problem that extends beyond policing. Mm -hmm. um, recently, I've been asking friends to talk about the time that they had the police pull a gun on them. Mm -hmm. And I've been surprised at how many of them, how many of my friends who are African American have had that experience. How many of my friends who are pastoring now have had that experience where they might not have survived to become a pastor. And I know that for me, my experience of that happened when I was maybe five or six. The police pulled my mom over and my brother and I, so I was maybe five or six, my brother was maybe three or four. Um, they shone the bright lights and they came to the car with their guns drawn. Um, and I remember, and they told us to be still or they'd shoot. Mm. And I remember wanting to look at my little brother because I'd never seen him be still. And I realized our lives depended on it but I was afraid to turn around because he was sitting in the back. I was sitting on the passenger seat. I was five maybe, right? So um, some of this is about the way that we do policing, but, but the deeper issue is about the way that we regard one of, cert certain bodies as marked as dangerous mm -hmm. and others as not. I should also say that I heard from a pastor friend of mine who's also a divinity professor, divinity school professor, um, who got his degree uh, uh, in Hebrew Bible at Duke, who was out in Charlotte, North Carolina last night. And he basically said that um, the protest was peaceful. The police were kind of marching alongside. They were maintaining control, but they were mm -hmm. also, to some extent, they were you know, stopping traffic at major thoroughfares and the like. And that there were members of the crowd eventually at some point as the night went on who began to try to incite violence. Um, and that's basically when he left. So, you know, in, a, in a, the protest in Charlotte, mostly the crowd was peaceful, but there were some instigators who the, my pastor friend thought might have been outside instigators. 
I think that's what the governor of Minnesota has now come out and said is going on in his state, that most of the people that are causing problems are, are in fact, I think I read just today that everybody that was arrested last night was not from Minneapolis. Was from, okay. They so, were from outside. So in the same way that there, there are good police officers and bad police officers, there are sometimes instigators in protests who are trying to um, um, inspire violence or um, misbehavior of some kind or other. Um, we shouldn't vilify all protests and we shouldn't vilify all police officers. But I actually think that um, conversations where we come to an understanding like your experience with your uh, friend, um, the air marshal are important. And police departments know this. Community outreach is a, a central part of their activity and their budget. Uh, you know, my mom taught uh, band and she, you know, put several kids in the police department jazz band. And why would the police department have a jazz band? It was community outreach. So we mm -hmm. understand this, right? Some of this is about explaining policing to the population. And some of this is about the population explaining how they experience policing. So again, I think there's room for conversations that may feel difficult initially, and that if you stay in the conversation, you'll learn something. Um, if you find the right conversation partners. And that conversation can only be aided by relationship. That's right, that's right. right. And that's the goal, isn't it? Yeah. Um, we don't wanna be policed by strangers. Community policing, right? I mean, isn't this something that the police came I, up with? <laughs> I, think bo I think both of our uh, principal law enforcement officers in this area, the uh, chief of police of Tampa and the chief of police of St. Petersburg have, have come out publicly and said that it's, it's pretty hard to defend what they saw in the video, that that, that was not a, a method of restraint that they teach in their academies and not one that they endorse. So it's, it's helpful, I think, too, to hear from top law enforcement officers when stuff like this goes on, if, if, to hear them say those things is important. And let's talk about how difficult it is, right? There's a strong yeah. police union, there's the potential for, for political backlash to admit something like that, there's the potential for legal liability to admit something like that, and policing is difficult. We understand this, it's dangerous, right? Uh, there are bad actors out there. Mm -hmm. so, so we get, we get all of that, um, and yet, Police officers want to be able to come home at the end of the night to their families, right? They, they, they're, you know, most of them are not bad actors or bad apples or what have you. Um, so, so the goal is to make this more possible, you know, um, for them to come home peacefully at the end of the, at the end of their shift and for the people they're policing to come home peaceably at the end of the shift. Um, to acknowledge that some stuff just isn't right, is actually courageous, um, and that most police officers are not doing that sort of thing. But, but the, also the, the wantonness of it. I mean, the, the, the video is, is difficult to watch with reason. So. And, and I think too, um, what a lot of the police officers that are, that are working these protests and these riots are responding to is uh, acts of violence that are being perpetrated uh, within the community. Um, now they're, they're protesting an act of violence, some cases with violence as the form of protest. So I wonder, what do you think about the role of violence versus nonviolence? I mean, whether you wanna talk about uh, policing or police work, or whether you wanna talk about uh, civil disobedience and protest, what, what role do violence and nonviolence play in all this? I think that's a great question, and I think that's a really difficult question, and I'll acknowledge really struggling with it. I have to confess to you, I'm a child of the civil rights movement, and nonviolence was our means of protest. Not that I participated in any, in any protests, I was too young for that, but that I, my thinking about this was absolutely shaped by that. Mm -hmm. um, I think that we haven't looked closely enough at Martin Luther King's theology of nonviolence. We've treated it as a social tactic, but it was his theology as a, as a Baptist preacher and, a, and a, a Boston trained theologian was shot through with this belief in nonviolence. 
um, as, a, as a tactic, as an approach uh, in the face of um, police dogs and fire hoses. And, you know, you see the pictures of people in their Sunday best going to, in, uh, to integrate lunch counters where they know that people are going to pour mustard and ketchup all over them and destroy mm -hmm. their clothing. Um, there was a way that African Americans purported themselves and carried themselves uh, in these protests and the media picked this up and, and understood because we were telegraphing uh, our Christian commitment um, that it was authentically motivated by our faith. But the civil rights movement was never in, in perfect agreement about, about nonviolence as a, as a tactic. A lot of people haven't heard of these, but there was a group called the Deacons of Defense. The Deacons of Defense. You hear that, Martha? <laughs> Just talking to my deacon here. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they, they were packed, packing. They, they were armed. And their job was to, with um, guns and rifles, to defend the pastors who were putting their lives on the line against the Klan and other violent groups. Um, so I personally um, articulate and believe in uh, nonviolence, but I, I'll be honest with you, perfectly honest with you, I've wondered recently if I need to purchase a firearm myself. Mm. I um, don't believe in them, don't agree with them, but I see chaos out here and trouble. And I see in my home state here, North Carolina, people with long guns going to protest the government um, and then going to buy a Subway sandwich afterwards with things that look like bazookas on their backs. Right? I saw that picture. Yeah. Um, I'll have pickles with that. And, you know, he's got, right. he's walking heavier than they walked in Iraq and Afghanistan. Right. Um, you, you know, we all saw the pictures from um, Ferguson where tanks rolled in American streets. Um, so the question that I'm asking myself is, do I feel safe? No. And do I believe that we as a nation respect nonviolence? No. I'm not at the point of buying a gun. I'm not at the point of doing that. But I have to confess, I've honestly thought about it. And mm -hmm. So it's a difficult question for me to answer. I think that this is a question that people need to bring their own theological resources to, their own social thought to. Um, it's not something to be done lightly. It's not something I'm advocating. I'm saying I'm struggling with. I understand why other people are doing it. But it seems to me that we'll just end up all shot and dead. And that concerns me too. Mm -hmm. So I'm troubled by the moment that we're in. I can acknowledge that as a single woman. I'm troubled by this moment that we're in. Um, I'm troubled by what I see around me. I still believe in nonviolence, but um, I remember that uh, there were people who hated nonviolence enough to blow up a church and kill four little black girls in Sunday school. Like, Violence, nonviolence, it all requires courage. And I think, you know, one of the elephants in the room for me, you just brought up the image of the guy that went to the Subway restaurant to buy a sandwich while wearing a bazooka. Um, you know, Subway might not be my favorite restaurant, but I've not gone armed to one before. <laughs> uh, there, there are a number of troubling images out there like that, and not the least of which, right, are groups of, of, uh, of all white protesters on the capital steps of some of our cities in America, heavily armed, right? Heavily armed and uh, no, no police interaction with them whatsoever. Groups of black protesters protesting the killing of George Floyd unarmed. gathered together in the street. Unarmed. Unarmed. And the rubber bullets and the tear gas canisters come out. I mean, I, I don't know that you can answer this question, but what do you make of that? Again, if you've decided that black bodies are dangerous. So again and again, uh, so Philando uh, Castillo. Right. 
had the right to carry the gun. Also in Minnesota, right? I think. Yes, also yeah. in Minnesota. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I heard this on the news, I can't verify it, but I'd heard that there have been 11 officer involved shootings in Minnesota in the last 10 years. Uh, Castillo was one of them. And the officer has the gun in the car, in the window, and he is shouting. And he's saying, I was afraid. Meanwhile, Castillo and his partner and his little girl who's in the back seat are not allowed to be afraid. They have to respond quietly, reasonably. They, mm -hmm. have, they are the ones de-escalating. Mm -hmm. He's saying, I have a license to carry this firearm. And he got shot, right? Um, blacks who openly carry get shot. So the other thing that I've been thinking about a lot recently is the times that I, um, that my black body was read as violent or dangerous. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, the one, one example that I can tell you, I went to a museum of um, a musical theater and the manager began to follow me around the theater, around the museum, the Museum of Musical Theater. He right. I mean, this is not where you think this sort of thing might go on. And finally, I had to convince him that I knew Madge and Gower Champion um, from Showboat by pointing them out to him so that he would stop following me. I'm thrilled I didn't have to do that because I couldn't right. do that. <laughs> I mean, I could have given him the lyrics of some Rodgers and Hammerstein. I didn't, you know, it would have been showy, right? But I had to document to him that I was just there to look at the exhibits, mm -hmm. right? Um, if black bodies are always read as, so part of the difficulty of teaching at a place like Wake Forest was I had to convince students that I knew what I was talking about. Um, in the fall semester, a colleague of mine at Duke asked me to be a guest lecturer in a class. I was, and there was a racist incident. A white student did not want to hear me. My colleague defended the student, believing that it wasn't racist. Several <laughs> students of color defended me. Uh, one gave the, the racist student a book so she could understand what it happened. She came to me later and apologized. Now, I teach about race and I am a person of color. And yet my colleague overrode my observation about the situation and used her expertise as a white woman. And this is at a premier institution of higher learning in our country. That's right. That's right. So, so race, churches are behind the eight ball with regard to race, we're worse. Up. So American churches are, sociologists say American churches are hyper segregated. That is more segregated than the, than the neighborhoods they're uh, located in. Mm -hmm. Now, neighborhood segregation required redlining and the federal government's mortgage policies that were discriminatory and um, the Klan you know, protecting segregated neighborhoods, and it required all of this coercion. How is it that churches that are places of free association are more segregated than American neighborhoods? We've enforced the segregation more successfully than American neighborhoods. So, so race is the last thing that gets discussed in, in churches, and so oftentimes people of faith are the least well-developed in their racial equity consciousness. They say the right things, but they often don't know how to live it out. And we, we should probably be leading as Christians. This was my hope and my expectation. And yet, yes, and so, so this, it's not the first time a racist incident has happened to me at, at, while teaching at a divinity school. But what was interesting was um, my expertise was overridden. Mm -hmm. um, if I had to the same professor taken over her area of expertise, you know, uh, um, and said, no, you're wrong, it would have looked ridiculous. But expertise about race and teaching about race, everybody thinks they know best. And so, um, so we, we need to have these deep 
difficult conversations. We need to hear people's truths across racial ethnic lines. We need to talk to and relate to the other. Um, we need to move beyond this, but, but churches really are not for the most part leading. And for many reasons, for the reason that pastors get pushed back if they have these conversations, mm -hmm. um, they feel uh, uncomfortable um, giving guidance about race. Um, they feel uh, put upon sometimes. And, you know, there's always the risk that congregants are going to withhold uh, offerings or support. Um, the conversations like this end up being labeled as political. Um, I actually think they're not political as much as ethical. Mm. And I think that the instruction that pastors give in difficult times is about how to live a godly life in it. And sometimes that's about showing your own struggles. For example, the, the conversation we had about violence and nonviolence mm -hmm. was my showing how I'm wrestling with this issue ethically, where I have not yet come to a conclusion. I have not yet moved from my previous um, endorsement right. of nonviolence, but I'm feeling pushed by what's going on is a way of bringing people into having this kind of ethical thought for themselves. I, I think that there's a job for pastors and for teachers to show how we do our deliberations, to mm -hmm. show how we arrive at our conclusions, but also to show us wrestling. Like we, we're not fully formed theological creatures. We're in the context of being formed by God and by society. Right. And I, and I like how you frame this type of conversation as an ethical conversation, as a Christian conversation. Um, it hasn't happened very often, but, but when it has happened, I get frustrated when uh, somebody suggests that when, when I'm teaching or preaching about something that Jesus would have said or done or Jesus did say and do in response to these kinds of, of incidents, it gets labeled as a political thing. When it's, it's not a political thing, it's a, it's a Christian thing. And this is what I just preached at, on, the, on this, the Feast of Pentecost, uh, that we are called in our baptismal covenant to respect the dignity of every human being. If you're a baptized Christian, that's what you're called to do. That's not a political statement. That's a theological statement. And I think that uh, churches of all kinds can do better in, in leading with these sorts of theological statements. You're right. It's Pentecost. It's Pentecost, right? So, so we remember this moment of fire from heaven, right? Where, where God baptizes us um, and the church is created. Uh, as I'm watching these other fires, these, these strange fires kindled around the country, right? I'm reminded of the fire of the Holy Spirit. So mm -hmm. much of this is the work of the Holy Spirit to invite us into communion with one another and to invite us um, to, to communicate in a new way, right? Speaking in tongues is a way, you know, it's the reversal of the Tower of Babel moment, right? right. Where, yeah. where the languages were confused. Now people are able to speak and understand one another. And part of this is the work of the Holy Ghost. And so it's, and it's marvelous in our eyes. It's a miracle that we're able to come together as a community, that a thing called the church could exist in this world, in these mm. most difficult times. What we're doing is, is dangerous. It's challenging. And yet it's, it's, it's so life-giving. You know, the, the um, lectionary text last year, I thought about it. Uh, it was um, Acts 1-8. Um, and you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And that power, it's the Greek word dunamin, from which we get the word uh, dynamite. <laughs> so, okay. You I did Hebrew, not Greek. <laughs> yes, right. well, I did Greek, not Hebrew. So. I'll rely on you for that. Um, so you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Power to be my witnesses. And that witnesses is martyrs, martyrs. Power to be my martyrs. That is witnesses unto death, right? Well, that brings us whole, full, full circle because we're talking about resurrection and life mm -hmm. in the midst of death. Well, so we will, have, we will have the power from the Holy Spirit to be witnesses, to speak the truth. Uh, you know, the temple in Jerusalem was the most public place. And they're there. And it was a, it was a, a, a pilgrimage festival, the Feast of Pentecost. It was a feast where everyone 
who was outside of Jerusalem was invited to come. And at this point in the early first century, um, there were more Jews living outside of Jerusalem than in Jerusalem. And, and, and the book of Acts tells us that there were people from all over, uh, proselytes and Cretes and, 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 and people from all of the, the, di the Jewish diaspora. It's this very public setting. And they're speaking praises to God. That's our invitation in this moment. A very public discipleship, praising God, powered by the Holy Spirit, which is dunamis. Like it's the it's the English it's the Greek word from which we get dynamite. We've been given power, dynamite, mm -hmm. to be witnesses even unto death. Right? That's what Pentecost is. That's our celebration, and the world needs us in this moment as salt and light. And in these kinds of moments. Um, being empowered to speak is important. Words are, words are important. Actions are important too, but words are important uh, as, as well. well we've, we've been talking about this from a pretty uh, lofty academic position, uh, which I think is fair, right? You're a, you're a, a Howard grad uh, with an MDiv from Howard, an undergraduate degree from Howard, but, but also a, a theological doctorate from Harvard. So uh, uh, an academic conversation is appropriate, but I want to I want to turn us now a little bit more to the personal, and um, and maybe this this gets more difficult. Uh, when you first see or hear about one of these types of incidents, or you see the video, or you hear the news report, the death of of George Floyd, the death of Ahmed Arbery, uh, the the death of Philando Castile, Alton Sterling all of them, how does, it, how does it hit you? What do you feel in your heart? You think about people you love who could have been any of those men or women. You think about, I know that for me, I, after seeing the Floyd video, just, it transforms even walking your dog into this dangerous, is it safe to go out? Or will someone stop me? Um, will I be pulled over? You think about the mothers and the grandmothers whose children are not returning to them. You think about the generations. Um, as a historian, um, you know, I know that not everyone in a black community got lynched, but there was a thing called a spectacle lynching, which was um, a lynching that was publicized. So in the local paper, hmm. um, people would buy postcards for them. Um, when I taught at the University of Virginia, one of my students told me that his family had kept a piece of Nat Turner from Nat Turner's rebellion in 1831 and that they still had it. Um, the point of a spectacle lynching was to keep the black community contained, fearful, not pushing for our right to vote or our right to employment. Um, these video, videos function as, as spectacle lynchings. Um, you know, people question whether or not it's a lynching. Is it, you know, were there, um, were there many people? Were there just a few people? Um, I know that the first semester that I taught at Duke, there was a, a noose left on the student center. Um, the point is to threaten the point is to frighten. And you would not be human if you didn't feel that. Mm -hmm. So you feel, you feel the danger of being a person of color in this nation. Um, and this is, what, this is why I struggle, struggle with hope. Um, because I had, as a, as a historian, as a child of the civil rights movement, my parents both benefited from the civil rights movement. My dad grew up in Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, a college town, University of Virginia is located there, but he could not have attended the University of Virginia, although he was a good student. Um, 
he attended Howard and then uh, he got his master's degree from New York University and then he got his law degree from George Mason because he got out of Charlottesville, right? Um, I thought about our progress as being a constant, a graph constantly going up, our racial progress. And I've realized that that's not at all the case. And I've come to mourn the possibility that I won't see the justice that I've longed for. And um, that's what happens when I see those videos. Mm. I'm more for us. I'm more for the future generations. And, and I've struggled, I, I, I'll be honest, when I struggle most in my faith, it is because um, I see people who also call themselves Christians, who see nothing wrong with those videos. That's the, that's, that's the, um, the most difficult moment for me is the church's response or lack thereof. Thank you. So does the moral arc of the universe still bend towards justice? It does, but it's long. And I may not see the end of it. Um, just like my grandparents and great-grandparents and great-great-grandparents didn't see the end of it. But they continued, nevertheless, the struggle. That's the challenge. Whether or not, you know, I heard, heard a pastor say one time, if, you, if God has called you to go to New York, you get on a plane. If you can't get on a plane, you get on a bus. If you can't get on a bus, you start walking. If you can't walk, you face New York and fall. <laughs> <laughs> if I can't get on a plane to justice or a train to justice, I'm gonna go stand out front in my yard and fall in its direction. That is whatever it is that I can do, I will do it. And trust God, can these bones live? Lord, you know. Thank you so much. That, that's an amazing place to bring us to a close. And I'm super appreciative of, of, of your friendship and your, your professorship over me, but also your willingness and openness today in this conversation. I hope um, that uh, those of you that are watching this uh, have learned something, have gotten something of value out of this. And it's been, it's been my absolute privilege to, to spend this time with you, Dr. Cooper. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pastor. <laughs> I, I hope that we can close with the words that our Savior has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. I want to thank all of you who have been watching this interview that we've been having with Dr. Valerie Cooper from Duke Divinity School. Again, I'm Father Ryan Whitley, the rector of St. Thomas Episcopal Church in St. Petersburg, Florida, a part of the Episcopal Diocese of Southwest Florida. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.